Um, so welcome everyone, it's great to see you all here. Um, I do have a few disclaimers to start off with. So the first one is that Russell and I aren't neuroscientists. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're um, career practitioners, but we're really interested in this area. The second kind of comes from that first disclaimer, which is that we've only got an hour, um, and we could talk for hours and hours and hours about this topic because we really are so interested in it. So we're going to try very hard to stick to time. We've got our colleague here in the front, Cloda, who's going to signal us um, if we sort of start talking too much. <laughs> so she's our time wrangler. Um, you're welcome to ask questions as we talk. If we do start to run out of time, then we might just have to park those questions, but we'll just see how we go. And then the final thing is you will be sent the PowerPoint. So you can relax, and if you were thinking of taking notes, you won't need to. Okay. So in terms of what we're covering, so decision making. So we'll have a brief look at decision making, and then we'll talk in particular about the importance of the prefrontal cortex. About the important, um, the importance of the early years in your life, and then also how sort of this knowledge can help with career decision making. Neuroscience is actually a really young field. So we've gone from dissecting people's brains to reading the bumps on people's heads to figure out what their personality is. Um, apparently, uh, around about here is your morals. <laughs> so that's where um, we've got veneration, um, benevolence, hope, Spirituality, it's all this part of the brain, apparently. Um, however, now we've got magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI. So that happened around about the 70s and 80s. So we didn't have to read bumps and we didn't have to cut up brains to actually get an idea of what was happening. The great thing about MRIs is you can get people to do a task and you can see which part of the brain is actually illuminated. So that's way better than cutting up dead ones. <laughs> Tells you a lot more. However, we still actually even now don't fully understand the processes, so we're still learning about this. Um, we do know that there's a number of areas in the brain involved in decision making, but we're focused on the prefrontal cortex because it actually matures really slowly. And it's got a lot of implications for making career decisions. So that's why we're focusing particularly on that. Actually, before I start talking about decision making, I've got a question for you. So, what is the average age at which human beings are likely to make rational decisions about important events in their lives? <laughs> 25. 25? 25. Give me 25. Okay, what else? Any other ages, Tim? Never. Never? Okay, why never? I think you're just thinking about guys, actually. <laughs> what were some of the other ages? 30. 30? Okay. What else? 35. 35. This is really interesting, because if you think about it, what age can you drive a car, drink alcohol, join the army and shoot people? It's quite scary, isn't it? What age are you tried as an adult, and yet none of you said under 20? So it has a lot of implications. The answer is it depends. It depends on so many factors, and Russell will be talking more about those factors in a little while. But in terms of decision making, so our decisions make us who we are. So at each fork in the road that we come to, we've got to make some sort of decision, and then that influences us until we get to the next fork and the next fork. So effective decision making, it's not just, um, it's not possible without motivation and meaning. Um, that's provided by our emotional input. So there are studies that they've done. So there was one particular person who he had an injury to his limbic system, which is where your emotions are seated. So you would think, I can't remember how old he was, but say 30s, you would think that that would turn him to a Spock-like character that could make very precise, rational decisions. No, he was paralyzed by indecision. We actually need our emotions as well as our rational prefrontal cortex. We need both, and we need them to work together. So Russell will talk more about that in a little while, but um, essentially our prefrontal cortex takes a long time to develop, and the connections between the limbic system, where our emotions are, and the prefrontal cortex, that takes a while to mature as well. 
So there's, um, we need the rational prefrontal cortex, there's three core executive functions. So you've got impulse inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility, and they're all interrelated. They seem to underpin processes such as goal setting, planning, prioritizing, sustaining and switching attention, um, initiating and monitoring actions. So we need those three to do those things. We need them to help us self-regulate and stop and think. And they're crucial for career decision making, all of those things, if you think about it, you need them to make career decisions. So I've got another question for you. So how old were you when you were first asked, what do you want to be when you've grown up? Four, five. Tim? I was about five years old, and my reply is I wanted to be a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably some people who are still being asked it as an adult. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I got that for quite a while, actually. Yeah. Um, how, how did that make you feel when you were five years old being asked that question? Excited for the possibilities. Yeah. Okay, I actually told Tim that I was going to ask him this. <laughs> <laughs> He's a plant. And Zoe, what about you, Zoe? Um, I think my mum has some video of me being asked when I was like two. And I think, obviously, I don't remember too much, but I think it was like really confused when I was asked later in life because it was like, what are we doing? Yeah, that, that was me as well. I don't know how old I was when I first got the question, but I do know that. I was about 14 and there was one side of the family didn't know that well and the aunt that I was most scared of, I, this woman terrified me, she actually later on it was okay but I was still really scared of her and she asked me that dreaded question surrounded by other uncles and aunts mm -hmm. and also I was very shy as well and I got that question and it was sort of like I mumbled I didn't know, what do you mean you don't know, you should know by now. <laughs> Yeah, I still remember. It's the emotions, emotions um, associated with that memory. <clears throat> um, so at a time when we're expected to make decisions about our careers, our prefrontal cortex isn't fully mature. And as I said before, um, sort of like the limbic system, that isn't properly connected with the prefrontal cortex. We're supposed to make these decisions at 2, 5, 10, 12, 14, 18. I'm not saying you can't make good decisions when the brain isn't fully mature, of course you can. Um, but it's more difficult. And I think that leads on to you. Cool. Thank you very much. You're very yeah. welcome. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of science behind the brain. And like Peta says, I'm really, really interested in this. This came about probably about two years ago. Um, so working in careers, and I just had this underlying feeling that in the careers industry, we're actually not serving our clients well, usually young people. I thought that we just didn't understand what was going on. So I did quite a lot of research to try and find out who actually knows about the brain. Sure, you find it in academia and you find people who are neuroscientists, but it's really hard to find somebody who talks openly about how the brain functions. So I came across a guy called Nathan Wallace. Okay, now some of you may have come across Nathan because he does an awful lot of talks, especially in early childhood centres. Uh, schools and he talks about young people. You'll find him on Catherine Ryan, 9 to noon. He does a lot of parenting stuff. So Nathan and I have done workshops. I've sat down and talked to Nathan and I've asked him so many questions. He was a neuroscience educator and is and does an awful lot of work on this. If you ever get the chance to go and see him, Nathan Wallace, go. He's really, really interesting. But some of the things that he started talking about is the brain. So I think one of the things you've got to be really careful about is these terms that they use, like adolescence, you actually can't define what adolescence is with neuroscientists. It seems to change. So this has come from MIT, not our friends down the road, Manukau, <laughs> okay? The other one that's somewhere in the States. So, you know, this is sort of like puberty to 18 is the sense of adolescence. What they know through those fMRI, MRI scans is that the brain goes through a huge change, okay? large growth and pruning, pruning of the nerves that are inside the brain, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And it generally is from the back to the front. So as Petter says, the bit that's the prefrontal cortex is sits behind your forehead, okay? This is the last part of the brain that usually matures. It's engaged, and it is, 
But when you, and I'm talking to the parents here, excuse me, but if you've got adolescents, teenagers, usually you know when they're in that stage because they're incredibly emotional. All right, there is no self-restraint in those kind of things. So at eight, up to about 18, and again, about 18, you know, there is this change going on. There's a new term that's come out, which is called emerging adulthood. Okay, so it's the bit between adolescence and adulthood. Generally, 18 to 22, or probably 25. Now, as Peter says, when are you an adult? When is the brain mature? The problem is that there is no blue spot in the brain that turns blue when you're mature. It depends. <laughs> it just happens. And it's really interesting. You could talk to, and we do, talking to 18, 19 year olds. They're totally different to if you talk to postgrads. They're totally different to mature students in their 30s because you can see the change in the brain. So what happens is that prefrontal cortex starts to develop. Okay? The executive functions, as they call them, start to come on. Planning. Planning ahead. Evaluating risks and rewards. <coughs> Interestingly, neuroscience at the moment is focusing on a lot of the deficits that are happening in society. So there's an awful lot of research around things like mental health, suicide, the effect of drink, drugs and drink on young people. If you ever try and find something about neuroscience and career decision making, there is nothing, absolutely nothing. It's like the careers industry is stuck in the dark ages somewhere. So I have to tell you, this talk that you're getting now, you will not get anywhere else in New Zealand, <laughs> all right? And in fact, you probably won't get it anywhere else like Australia or around the world. I have done so much research to try and find people and it's just dark space, okay? So those evaluating risks and rewards, that's why young people make silly mistakes. Nigel Latter talks about this an awful lot. You know, if you've got a young son, all right, if you want to increase the, increase the uh, dangers of them having a car accident, put their best mate in the seat next to them. If you want to increase it again, put their two mates in the back. And usually the kind of things that you hear is, why did you do that? I don't know. It's a natural reaction because the frontal cortex, which is about reasoning, is not really online. It's th they're still in the limbic brain. So problem solving, thinking ahead, self-evaluation. The two things that are happen, myelination is about insulation. It's about making the nerves and the connections happen quicker. So some of the things that they're doing and the research is that young people, when they solve problems, they can solve them as fast as adults, but in some ways they're not using the same parts of the brain. Different parts of the brain light up. So what does that mean? Well, probably what's happening is the brain is trying to figure out where those easy connections are, which are most efficient and most effective. Can I just sort of say here and now that teenagers of today are no different over the past? We, are, we were exactly the same if you were my age, you know, early 30s. <laughs> I only say that because I want to know you're listening. All right? <laughs> and synaptic pruning. That's the pruning the nerves, the ones that are used and the ones that are not used. This is the whole thing like when you say you're hardwired, when you're set in stone. Interestingly, those beliefs and ideas that you have of yourself can be changed. And that's, you know, there's a lot of work going on in the States that people who believe that they haven't got a hope and there's no point, if you actually put them through certain programs, they do change the way they think. The brain is plastic, it does mold. So when you said, does it ever end? No, there's some evidence, say in 60, 70 years of age, that it's still happening, okay? So there is quite a lot of stuff going on, but as you can see, it's from 18 onwards where some of the executive functions are starting to come into, into play. So our question and my question to start off with was, at 18, when you leave school, how on earth do you make a good decision? How on earth do we expect you? And the fact is, at 18, when you leave school, how long has that been around? Forever. So shouldn't we be moving with the times? Later adulthood, mid-twenties or older, full maturity of the brain and the executive functions. Okay? Now, interestingly, again, if you talk to Nathan, he will say there's an awful lot of research in terms of how quickly does this, does this work? How quickly do you come to a free frontal cortex? 
When do you hear it? I hear it because quite often I get students who come in and they start talking in a very logical, coherent way. <laughs> okay? And I will actually say to them, I'm going to ask you a really strange question. What? Are you first born? Yes. So Nathan's idea, and the research seems to suggest this, is that the first 1,000 days are incredibly important for the development of the brain. Not in terms of how it develops, but when it develops. Have you seen the adverts on the TV? The first 1,000 days? That's come from Nathan. All right? You hear an, an awful lot saying about it. So it's the first 1,000 days, which is from conception to at nine months and then afterwards. The most important thing is the dyadic relationship. The usual thing is it's the most dominant parent, usually mum, and it's the talk. If you think about it, firstborn, quite often it's this. What happens then is, if you have another child, usually you've got a two-year-old running around while you're trying to talk to your second one. And you're going, oh, it's so cute. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> So that sort of interrupts it. And the evidence and the research suggests that what that possibly does is it delays the development of the prefrontal cortex. Now, if you've got two, three, four children, you think about what your first one's like to what your fourth one is like. Other evidence that it can be cited? The most underrepresented population in New Zealand prisons is firstborn female. Puberty has an impact on this. Naturally, puberty happens in women earlier than it does for guys. Firstborn females, most underrepresented population in New Zealand prisons. On that basis, which do you think are the most overrepresented? Thirdborn, fourthborn male. Why? Because at 16, 17, 18, they make stupid decisions. What were you thinking? I don't know, just did it because he said. <laughs> All right? It is also in context. So if you have a firstborn or a secondborn or a thirdborn, again, statistically, the firstborn in the family is the most successful. Money, job, career, those kind of things. But there are exceptions, always exceptions. So it depends on things. So here's a case. Say, for example, you've got um, a girl born. But what happens is they're born to a sole parent. OK, now it's not a bad thing, but that could be a step to this way, which is, OK, it's going to delay frontal cortex. Mum also suffers from mental health. Mum is quite isolated with no family. So you see, with the context, things can start to develop where it is going to affect the development of the brain. Now, they know this. One of the classics is the whole thing around Romanian um, uh, adoptions. You know, the ones that are in the um, nurseries? No contact whatsoever. The amount of delay in terms of brain development around that. But at the same time, if you've got mum who's a sole parent, okay, speaks two languages, which indicates possibly about, you know, being bilingual has some impact on brain development, is surrounded by family, has really good support, has actually got an academic education up to master's level, so you see that context is really quite important. So you have to sort of say, yeah, here's the brain and here's the development, but you have to take things into context as well, which makes it incredibly difficult, especially when we sit in front of a student who comes in and goes, so I'm doing this major. What can I do with it? <laughs> so the main changes that we see, up puberty to 18, Again, if you're a mum and dad, you'll see this. Young people, you will notice this, but you get better abstract thinking, seeing patterns and understanding things like fairness. Okay? They start to understand how the world starts to operate. Still a bit limited with right and wrong. I've got a 19-year-old daughter. You were wrong to do that, no one. You shouldn't have said this. I said that because of what you did and what you said. Nah. Okay. So straight away, I'm like, I know she's in a limbic brain. I know she's in a limbic brain, and me trying to rationalise and reason with her, I might as well forget it. So I just sort of take a step back. That's a point for parents, actually. Realise when they're in the frontal cortex. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So interestingly, with my daughter, um, after I heard this with Nathan two years ago, of course she's in year twelve, 
And I just sort of said to her, look, I actually think that when I try and talk to you, you're in your limbic brain. Can I just say, if you ever want to hear young people in their limbic brain, <laughs> all right, get on a bus in front of two or three young people, and all you'll hear is every third word is, oh, like, like, it's so cool. That's them in their limbic brain. All right, if you ever want to talk to a young pe person when they're in the limbic brain, you're wasting your time. <laughs> so I realized this with my daughter and I thought, I've got to pick the time when she's probably going to come into her frontal cortex because they do naturally. So I said to her, is it first thing in the morning? I don't think so. When you wake up, she went, mm, no. <laughs> OK, she's gorgeous, my daughter, by the way. Um, when you come home from school, I don't think that because you're tired, you're hungry, you want to get on Facebook and find out what your friends are doing. Yeah, probably. I said, but have you ever noticed, you know, about half six, seven o'clock at night, you just come wandering out? All right, Dad, how's it going? Ah, oh, it's going good. Now's my opportunity. Now, it changes with everybody. But I know that if I want to talk to my daughter, I have to listen whether she's in my limbic brain. Parents, if you're actually talking to a young person and you've got a great conversation, their brother and sister walks in the door, you've got no chance. Because all of a sudden, limbic brain and limbic brain trumps frontal cortex. <laughs> all right? So if you ever want to hear it, sit, ne sit next to a group of young people at a cafe on a bus, listen to them talk. Oh, look, look, look. <laughs> limbic brain. Trying to get any reasoning out of them, forget it. So up to 18, intense emotions and thrill-seeking. There's a guy called Lawrence Steinberg. He's a psychologist, and he talks a lot about this as well. And he says, really, with the limbic brain, it's like an accelerator on a car. It's flat to the floor. The frontal cortex are the brakes. That's about regulation. Should you do this? No. Again, Nigel Latter talks about a great story. You can have a really great conversation with young people, young guys. And then all of a sudden, their mate will meet them outside the door and go, hey, why don't we get in my car, go down the road and see how fast we can go? And then afterwards, you go, why did you do that? And they go, oh, don't know. That's them not being able to apply the brakes. All right, that's the frontal cortex. That's a good indicator. So when I get young people in, sat in front of me and they're talking very coherently about, so I'm going to do this and that, and I'm already thinking ahead and everything. How old are you? 19. Are you first born? Yes. Again, Nathan talks about, he did a, a survey in Christchurch. There were 100 gifted kids, 50 boys, 50 girls. He did say to me, he says, the girls were certainly gifted, some of the boys weren't. <laughs> he says, I think they were making up the numbers. <laughs> but, but after a while, he just sort of decided, he just turned around and he went, random question, how many of you are firstborn out of 100? How many do you think, put the hand up? 90. So, you know, even at that age, you know, there's a lot to be said for this. So we've got to start to understand this and that the context and the implications are really important. Between 18 and 22, 25, you start to see more complex thinking. They put together abstract ideas, values, a sense of self. Actually, this is really important, this sense of self. Who am I? Where is my place in the world? What is important to me? What do I think about? If you think about it, they're very abstract ideas, and if you have not got your frontal cortex coming online very often, they are sort of like, so I'm really, imp I'm really yeah, I think I'll do, oh, look. Girl, oh, no, 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 food. This will happen. It's a bit of distraction. Trying to hold those ideas are really hard for young people. So abstract ideas like, what do you want to do when you finish? Really hard. They appreciate diverse views. Yeah, I can see what you're seeing, you know. Put themselves in other people's shoes. They actually get better at doing that. Better emotional self-control. They apply the brakes. But the last point is really important. It's very new. It's not going to be done all the time. It takes time and it takes practice. Unfortunately, parents, you've got to have patience, OK? And really encouraging those kind of things, all right? Mid-twenties and older, that's when you see it. So like I say, when PhD students come in, and they're usually in their late twenties, early thirties, conversations I have about who they think they are are far more different to a young person at 19, 20. Totally different. 
One, their frontal cortex is definitely engaged. They're able to think of things, abstract ideas, talk about what they think about, all right? And actually have just done, had a lot more experience, which is really important. All good? Cool. So, sorry, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look, I, I, think, I think sometimes if you really want to, just get onto YouTube, all right, and, you know, stupid people, <laughs> and you will see it. And, you know, it's like the limbic brain is always there. And again, that probably comes again from family upbringing, you know. Um, and there are some people who are in the frontal cortex, but they don't make great decisions and get very emotional. You know, people who fly off the handle all the time. Okay, what's going on? Because that's the limbic brain. So in that sense, then, if you're thinking like, you know, YouTubing, YouTubing stupid people, would things like, you know, alcohol and other yes. sort of things actually take you from being in your frontal cortex back yes. into the limbic system? Then? Yeah, because what happens is your frontal cortex is going, yeah, I'll have a glass of wine. You have your glass of wine, and all of a sudden your limbic brain takes over and you go, I'm going to have the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and then next day your frontal cortex comes out online and it goes, what the hell, what was I thinking? I don't know. I don't know about, you know this, no matter how old you are, you've been out and then next day you've gone, the hell was I thinking? What did I do? Usually that is not like me because all of a sudden that common sense, logical person that you are just goes out the window, that's under the influence, which is why they're interested in the effect of drugs and drink on young people and how that. Most pe young people, the cause of death is accidents. Them doing things that are created in accidents. It's the biggest cause of death for young people. Them not doing things where you go, why did you do that? I don't know. There was another question. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, like, let's say you get to the point where you are fully developed and you can you know, logic and reason. Do you ever get to that point? Is it normal for, say, a PhD student to be good with abstract ideas and waver? Yeah, I would say so. I don't think, uh, you're never going to be not in your limbic brain. There are going to be times. I'll tell you when you find that you're in your limbic brain is when your best friend that you haven't seen for 20 years suddenly appears and you start talking and you get really excited. <laughs> you see it in young people. Best time of your life is 18 when you're getting flooded with all these chemicals, dopamine. Usually when you start laughing because your friend's laughing and you're going, what are we laughing at? I don't know. <laughs> but as an adult, you will get to that stage with some people. So you will flit in and out of your... I think what we're saying, what seems to be said is that as an adult, you can keep in your frontal cortex for longer. To young people, that's why we are boring. <laughs> you know, we're incredibly boring to young people because we're in our frontal cortex and we're so logical. That's why you can stand at the breakfast bar and you can make breakfast for everyone. You can make the lunches. You can think about what you're going to do afterwards, do your shopping, and you're trying to say to someone who's 17, have you got your bag? <laughs> oh, they wander into the room and then they come out and they haven't got the bag. <laughs> Didn't you go and get your bag? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> So we stay in our frontal cortex, but quite happily, we can go backwards and forwards. So the frontal cortex is about exercising control over your limbic brain to suppress it and keep it under control a little bit. Some people are really boring. <laughs> Hi. Um, I've, I've heard that sort of social media and information overload makes people stupid because it's like, it makes us think too much like not process things properly? Okay, so, is that the same no, I th I, and actually there is, the research around neuroscience is very conflicted. So if you want to prove something, you can prove something, all right? So the whole thing around social media, if you think about who's actually saying that, it's usually adults who probably don't understand that social media and they see the impact of people in their phones doing this all the time. When I was a kid, I was told off all the time for watching television. My parents were told off for playing with a hoop and a stick. You know, it was that long ago. <laughs> so we're always being told not to do something because that's the fad, but there is very little evidence around that is very conclusive to say what impact social media, computers, TV, violent games, it's very inconclusive. We have to be really careful. And one of the things I will say here is that the whole thing around neuroscience, you've got to be so careful because you can actually make it say what you want it to say. So things like those people who say, this will help your children 
develop. Do you see the story a few weeks ago about the place in Australia that had that claim? And they were bringing it into New Zealand and they were saying, put them in this school or this program and they will be you know, in, more intelligent. You can't claim that. There are some educational and other people who are claiming things that are not true. Neuroscientists will go, we haven't got enough research. We've only been doing this 10 or 15 years. We haven't got a longitudinal study to say what's true and what's not. So we can only infer and then think that may be, but we're not sure, okay? It's a bit like the advice we get about, you know, diets. You know, one minute wine is bad for you, the next minute red wine's great. <laughs> chocolate is bad for you, dark chocolate is good. Um, so at the moment, they're still discovering all of this, still learning. I'd like to think jogging is really bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads me into mindfulness as a superpower. Um, so there's lots of things we can do to sort of like aid our brain, sort of improve our sort of like decision making. So obvious things such as exercise, sorry, yeah. uh, <laughs> nutrition, so diet, so yep, two slices, two squares of dark chocolate a night are good, the whole block, not so good. Um, so there's things like that, there's also planning. So we need to be able to plan, but how many of us are taught how to plan? It's not usually something that's taught. Um, when you get to university, you might learn about short-term and long-term planning, but it would be nice if you could actually learn about those things earlier. Time management. How many of us are taught about time management? So those sorts of things will actually help. But I want to talk a bit about mindfulness because it actually ch um, studies have shown that it does actually change the brain. So what is mindfulness? It's a superpower. You'll see um, part of this, that the driver is in their limbic brain. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing. My Ears are turning red. I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts. I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. So that's mindfulness. Um, a shout out for the University of Auckland website. So if you just go on to auckland.ac.nz slash wellbeing, there's that DVD um, and there's other videos as well, all equally funny and cute, but also really on point. 
and there's other information on there about the importance of nutrition and exercise and everything else. Um, so why did I focus on mindfulness? It's because brain imaging shows that it does actually physically change your brain in a good way. Um, so basically, it's sort of like it makes changes in areas relating to all of those types of thinking. So complex thinking, decision making, introspection, the emotion regulation, etc. So what apparently happens is that you develop a thicker layer of neurons in your prefrontal cortex, and that's a good thing. Um, and also other areas of the brain, which I won't go into. Um, a 2013 study showed that 15 minutes of mindful meditation, you've got to do this regularly. So it's not enough to do 10 minutes every week or so. Um, but if you do it regularly, so 15 minutes of mindful meditation can help people make smarter choices. Studies have, studies have shown that mindfulness helps to lead to better decision making. A brief period of mindfulness allows you to make more rational um, decisions because you actually consider the information available in the present moment. And then you can do what Russell was saying is difficult for younger people, people with a less fully mature prefrontal cortex, and that, that's think about the future. Think about positive future outcomes. So just that little moment of pause. And you can also do something called the neuroeconomic cost of a decision. So mindfulness. And I think Russell is yep. now going to put it all together. Oh, all right, okay, hang on to your seats, here we go. <laughs> Have you um, got any questions? Any more questions? Good. No. <laughs> you still with us? Excellent. Okay, so um, one of the things that I think is you've got to hang on to this idea of neuroscience and what Peter was just talking about with mindfulness is that what they call metacognition, thinking about what you're thinking about. Actually, it's really okay to stare off into the distance and lose yourself. That's sort of that kind of thing. It's don't feel guilty about it. I think what you've got to be really careful about is there are some people who are going to do that. And like I said, in some contexts, they're going to have really quite negative thoughts. That's really quite dangerous. That leads to depression. So there's a lot of interest around the whole thing around mental health and depression and how that happens. I was just reading a study that's done at Victoria University. It's just come out and they've sort of talked to young people. And, you know, if you can get them to think in a more positive way, when I feel happy, I have been, it can change that. So it's about thinking about what you think about. I'll take for granted that most of us are positive people, so that's it. Now, putting it all together, in terms of the career decision making, I think we've got this wrong, badly wrong, okay? So when students come in and talk to me, they go, I've got this de degree, BCom, I've got two majors, what can I do with it? I know that the worst question you can ever ask a young person at university and at school, if you've got teenagers and they're at university or at school, don't ever ask them, when you finish school or finish uni, what are you gonna do? Every young person goes, don't ask me that question because behind every question, there's a statement. The statement is, you know what you're doing. And most young people go, I have no clue. So we always start with, what do you want to do? Wrong question. Where you should start is the other end. Now you'll see this, if any of you have been online recently, you'll see a guy called Simon Sinek. And he talks about the golden circles. I think he stole my idea. <laughs> Honest, I really do think this. Now he did his YouTube, uh, LinkedIn talk about 2009. I've applied this more to career decision making. So he talks about the golden circles. What is what most consumers or businesses actually focus on? We should focus on why. Why? Not why are you doing this degree, but the whole why. Why do you want to do it? It's about purpose. Big questions like, if you could change one thing in the world overnight, what would it be? What concerns you? What issues do you get really upset about? Now, if you think about it, young people don't ever get asked that. In fact, they don't get asked at school, they don't get asked at uni. And I'm going to say here, what are we teaching them? Because I think we do need to teach them. And as parents, you've got to ask your kids this. What concerns you? Because if they understand what purpose is, 
they then understand the next bit, which is the how. This is their degree. If they understand what the purpose is, then that makes sense as regards what they're studying. So I say to them, what are you studying? A BCom, I'm doing this. Okay, that's great. I can't answer that question at the end, we'll come to that. But I need to go back, I need to talk to you about what is your purpose? What are the things that are important to you? Because if we start to uncover that, then what happens is that line there means that this starts to link more closely. It's a really hard concept, so if you go back to the neuroscience, the frontal cortex, it's an abstract thought. Young people are usually developing a sense of purpose. There was a study done by a guy called Bill Damon, big study in the States. 20% of young people, he found, have a sense of purpose. There are others, about 40, 45%, that are developing a sense of purpose. They call them dabblers and dreamers. Worryingly, that the rest have no sense of purpose and have given up. I don't know what it is in New Zealand, but I wouldn't say that we're too far away from that kind of statistic. So one of the things we need to do is change our focus to purpose. Talk to young people about what concerns them. I would have to say that these young people today, probably because of parenting, and it's been more liberal, and I'm talking about my parents. My parents, the way they parented me, is not the way I parented my daughter. I'm far more about what I want to talk about. What do you want to talk about? Come and talk to me. So you find that young people today, when they say, I want to work for somebody who's got morals and values and things I believe in, they've actually leapfrogged us. We only start thinking about that in our 30s and 40s. In fact, we get to our 40s, midlife crisis. What is midlife crisis? All of a sudden, you've been putting up with things for so long, you get to midlife, kids have left home, and suddenly you go, I don't need to put up with this anymore. I don't need to, pay the, I don't need to earn this wage. I could do whatever I like. That's midlife crisis, all right? Young people are starting that earlier, in their 20s. You can hear it in the way they, they talk, and that's from liberal parenting. They are no different to us, it's just the context. The most important thing, as well, is not only the neuroscience behind it, but this is informed by experience. Again, if you think about 18-year-olds, what experience have they got? They've been to school, they've played some sport, they've maybe had a part-time job, they've lived in a family, they might have been lucky and been overseas. What else have they done? Experience informs purpose. It gives you a better sense of, this is what I like, this is not what I like, I believe in this. And it's really important because that sense of purpose develops because you look back on your life and you, make you see the continuity and the coherence. I remember as a kid when I was five, six, seven, some things that I've only just started to think about, I have a strong sense of what's right and wrong and justice. Things happened to me and I could talk to you about them that I went, that's not fair. And I got punished for things at school by my mum and dad and I went, that's not fair. So I've got a real deep level sense of trying to help people who can't help themselves. Because I don't believe that some people are in that situation because of themselves, the society, the system, whatever. So through my work, I started off as a school teacher. The kids I really liked, bottom set, 4G8. You know, they turn up with statement, they have a statement that they got teacher aides. There were more teacher aides in the class than kids. Oh my God, love them. Why? Because it's my sense of justice. I've had long contracts with work and income, helping people who can't help themselves, people who are vulnerable. That is my purpose. Everything I do is served by that purpose. It makes sense, therefore, that anything I do in terms of learning skills and knowledge is going to be linked to that, and whatever work I do, my career title, is always going to be that. So what and where I work allows me to affect change. It allows me to put into play what I think is important to me, my purpose. The further away you are from that line, you call it a job. Get a bit closer, it's a career. When you sit on that line, you feel it's a calling. You would do it for no money. There are some people who would work for Greenpeace, and they believe in Greenpeace, but all they do is a job. 
Why? Because they are far enough away. They're probably doing administration stuff, whereas what they really want to do is they want to do more activist stuff. They want to get involved. Bureaucracies are really good at pushing people out into jobs. So if you feel bored in your job, you've got to sort of think to yourself, what's my purpose and how far away from the line am I? You know what job stands for? Just over broke. <laughs> the other thing is for young people, if they're in their limbic brain for 90% of the time, it's really hard for them with their frontal cortex to make sense of that information. So the only way I come at it with them is, it's about your emotion. I explain this to young people and they get it. And they're so relieved. And they go home to their parents, hopefully, and they tell them. I even offer to go with them. I'll explain it to your parents. Yep. It's about feelings. If what you're doing as a degree feels right, that's okay. You can't articulate, because that's your frontal cortex. If you can't articulate it, but you feel it's right, that's okay. If you feel it's wrong, that's a problem. That line there, that's disjointed. And the other thing is, when you sit in your limbic brain, there is no language. That's why you get so excited. How do you feel? Are you everybody ask that? Guys, when you get asked, how do you feel? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're in your limbic brain. If you're in your limbic brain, it's hard to have language and describe. Frontal cortex does that. So that's what happens. Experience is really important. So purpose and passion. This is really important. This is stuff we should talk to young people about. This is where we should go. What is purpose? It's a generalized intention to accomplish something okay, that is meaningful to the self. Remember, the work I do means something to me. It makes sense to me. But the other side of it is that I'm doing it for the betterment of the world. Inherently, everybody, if you think about work, work is about being of service to someone else. We do lots of things for other people. So if you're doing something, and it doesn't have to be paid work, that makes sense to you, and you're doing it for someone else, that is purpose. It's not passion. I'm really passionate about sailing my boat. That's not for someone else, that's for yourself. But if you sail your boat and you take people who can't, no, wouldn't normally do that, disadvantaged kids, old folk, that's more purposeful. Do you understand the difference? Going to the beach every week, love that. That's about doing something for yourself. Going to the beach every week and cleaning stuff up, that's purposeful. Young people are developing a sense of that. Where does it come from? Some young people have trauma early in life, eight, nine, 10. The brain changes about eight, nine, ten. You see the world in a different way. Classic story about the old uh, Pete's dragon. You talk about Pete's dragon to an eight, nine, ten year old and they burst into tears. Where's Pete? Where's the dragon gone? Where's he gone? Five and six year old, they go, hey, oh, all right, whatever. <laughs> so the change in the brain at five or six is that you start to see the world in a different way. Your autobiographical memories, things that you start to remember. Have you ever realized, why do you remember some things and not others? Why is it that you remember some things? Really important things, things that affect you. Because that is where your purpose is coming from, things like that. So some young people, and I talk to them again, where does this come from? People who do health, doctors. When I was about nine, a young lady, when I was about nine, I remember being in a, a ward with my grandmother, who was in a lot of pain for two or three days. And the nurses really struggled to look after her. So what did you do? So I made a commitment that I was going to become a nurse. Where do you think she works and who does she work with? Old people. When I talked to her, and I said, so that's why you work with old people, because of the experience you had with your grandmother. How do I know that she's on the right track? Because she cried. She got really upset and tearful. Yeah. Couldn't explain it, just felt overwhelmed with emotion. That's a calling, OK? You talk to young people who've had trauma in their life, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, cancer, accidents, those kind of things. Anybody you see who's old, you know, in the news, usually if they're doing something that's different, you, they don't ever ask the question, do you remember something that happened when you were younger? 
That's the question you need to ask. For others, it develops, okay? And it could develop through things like what they're interested in. Interest is a really interesting area too, because we don't know much about the psychology of interest. Why do you get interested in some things? You ever try to do something on your own? Usually it's because you have to do things around people. People who are really good with their hands and make and do things, especially a guy, usually there was an uncle or a grandfather or somebody who showed them how to do it. Interests need to be triggered again and again and again and again. It never happens once. So it's been, sometimes it happens later in life, sometimes it happens, and sometimes it happens when you don't even know it's happening. So if you think about a young person, that is really hard for them. What are you interested in? I don't know. And they've got competing interests. And when you've got competing interests and your frontal cortex is sort of coming in and out of play, it's really hard to settle and say, I know what my purpose is. That's why as you get older, you become more purposeful. And actually as you get older, you become more resilient. So we've got to stop saying to young, about young people, Ugh, they've got no backbone, they're not like me. No, as you get older, you get more resilient. People in their 60s and 70s are more resilient than 30s and 40s and then 20s and 30s. There is proof on that, okay? Purposeful people. You need to be surrounded by purposeful people. You talk to young people, is there somebody in your family who's purposeful, who is encouraging? If they're doing business, I can guarantee most times they've got somebody in their family who's a business person. They come home, they listen to the stories that their parents or whoever that person is who tells them. They start to admire them, they like what they hear, they go, this is what I want to do. Somehow in there they've got to find a sense of why am I doing business, how am I going to make a difference, and who am I going to make a difference with. Once they start to think like that, great. I met a young lady, her father was involved in the uh, clothing industry. What does she want to do? She would love to open her own chain of shops for women. And I said, why? She says, because I've worked in shops and when women come in and get the right clothes, how they feel is fantastic. So do you want to learn how to run businesses that are successful for people like that? Absolutely. That makes sense to me because I want to help those poor people there is some rubbish out there and they feel terrible. I want to help women dress better. That made sense to her, she's doing it for other people. That's her purpose. It's not for me to judge, it's for her to try and understand it. So, what do you look for? Okay? In purpose, if you're talking to young people, You've actually got to look for continuity and coherence and understanding. You've got to try and see if there are patterns. And this is really, really hard. If you're a parent or if you're interested in this, talk to them about early childhood memories. Why do they remember some things? You know, 17, 18, 19 year olds, yeah, I remember. I remember. I remember. Okay. So why do they remember those and not the other things? What is it about some of those things? Ask them what concerns them in the world. If they had a choice, if they could change one thing in the world, what would you do? Most of them would maybe stumble and, yeah, I'm not sure. That to me is an indication that, yeah, they're still not quite there, but let's encourage it. Who are the purposeful people? Who are the people who surround them that are purposeful? What do they talk about? Role models in particular. A role model is the public personification of who you want others to see you as. Your role models are, that's how I want others to look at me. That's who your role models are. So you think about the people that you admire and think are role models, that's how you want others to look at you. Asking young people that is quite interesting. They haven't quite got it yet, but they're starting to develop it. And more than anything, rather than getting some kind of articulated answer, you've probably just got to say to them what feels right. If you're doing a law degree, does it feel right? Yeah, okay. Don't ask them what they're going to do with it because they haven't got there yet. But if it feels right, they're on the way. If there's hesitation, then sometimes it's somebody else's suggestion. That's always a problem. In your career, 
A simple question, what games did you like playing? It's quite interesting, you know, people who played Risk, Chess, that's actually them being very strategic. It's quite clear, people who do creative games, you know they're going to be creative in some way. But there is a lot of theory and careers around asking people what games they like playing. What are the books and films and TV shows they read and watch? Quite often they get interested in these because it links to purpose. If you've got a teenager, what do they keep watching? Hopefully it's not My Kitchen Rules and, you know, and, you know Married at First Sight. But, you know, there might be something in that. That could be entertainment, but there are some things they watch because it's uncovering some kind of purpose. You've just got to be aware of those things. What are they good at? You will invest time, effort, energy, and resources in things that you are good at and, and interests. And you are developing your skills. But again, that's the middle bit. That's how you're going to implement your purpose. What do you spend a lot of time doing and practicing? What feels right in terms of a career? Just very quickly, my daughter. My daughter, I told her, do not at 18 go straight off to tertiary study. I said, you know, this has got to be an investment, not a cost. And I'm sorry to say, but I think a lot of students go to 18 and parents will turn around and go, yeah, they haven't quite figured it out yet, but we're hoping in the next couple of years they'll get there. My God, that's an expensive experiment if you ask me. I'm not saying don't go off to university or polytechnic. I'm just saying, is 18 the right time? I'm not so sure for some young people, especially if they're second, third, fourth born, all right? Um, but I asked my daughter, she wants to get in the music industry and she wants to put events on. Where did that come from? When she was three, she started dancing. She's never going to be a dancer, my, my little girl, all right? But she loved the end of year show, the entertainment factor for the parents. She's always enjoyed it. Then she started playing the piano and was very good at it. Really good, actually. But through that, she's sort of come to the sense that she wants to put music events on. Why? Because when she goes to music events, it's how it makes her feel. And she wants others to feel that at a music event. The fact that you lose sense of time and you could do anything you want and you feel great. I'm mic'd up like this. I wish I'd been to Robbie Williams last night because I know Robbie would have made me feel like that, you know? So that makes sense to her. So, neuroscience says the brain takes much longer to mature than we first thought. The brain is not mature at 18. All right. At 12, it's probably the size of an adult brain, but the changes that go through could go through to mid-20s, early 30s, could be later. There is no consensus on this. They're starting to get some clearer idea. So we have to take that into account when we come back to things like career decision making. It's got implications on the executive functions, planning, thinking ahead, thinking about what you're thinking about. And a young person's ability to make sense their sense of identity, who am I? It's a very abstract thought. And trying to put that together is really hard. Ask them what they're good at and compliment if they are. I say to my daughter, I love the way that you talk to people. People come up to you and go, hey Laura, how are you? And she goes, I'm really well, thanks. How are you? I love that. So she engages in a conversation. Talk to them about the things that they're good at. An old boss of mine used to say, too many people focus too much on the whole and not enough on the donut. <laughs> you know, we're always being told what we're not good at, but what are we good at? Listen carefully, that is important. There's a lot of research around that if you do not listen and look away and are distracted, that has a real adverse effect on anybody, but especially young people. They get a sense that you're not interested and you don't care. Question you might like to ask young people, I did this with my daughter. As, as your dad, what should I do more of? As your dad, what should I do less of? What she said was, what you should do more of is give me more money. <laughs> and what you should do less of is stop saying no. <laughs> but interestingly, some will say, stop being on your phone. Spend more time with me. That's really important to young people. And talk to them about this stuff. In that sense of, that sort of sense of purpose, there are a group of people and a lot of people who unfortunately have to go to work to survive. 
That is a real interest of mine, obviously because of that whole thing around justice. If financial pressures get in the way, you can forget about purpose. It becomes something where you go, I ain't got time for that. I've got to go to work, I've got to earn money. It's about safety, security, putting a roof over my head and food on the table. And some people, when they're caught in that, they never get a, that practical sense of developing purpose. Except that what might happen is, their purpose is they go to work to put stuff on the table for their family. That's a purpose. That's okay. All right? But financial pressure. So for young people, and this is what happens, they get to the end of their degree, their degree. If they don't think about purpose and enact it, they suddenly get into a job, and before they know it, they've been in it three years. And it's got nothing to do with their degree, and they feel lost. So it's not those at 18 that we ought to worry about, it's those at 22, 23 who leave university and then drift. They're the ones that I really worry about because they get into the financial pressures of rent, possibly a mortgage, family, then you, that's it. 20 years before you come back to that midlife crisis. And committing to a stable sense of identity. Looking back, who am I? This is who I am. It's a really hard thing to do. But if you talk to them about that, this is what I think you're good at. Have you, I've noticed when. What do you think about? Really good time to talk, especially to young people, boys, take them for a drive. Because then you're not sat like this, you're sat like this. And I find, I love going on road trips with my daughter because she just talks. <laughs> and you get to hear so much. And I can ask her stuff. And she just gets on. So, you know, pick your time as regards when you talk to them and what you talk to them about and be encouraging. So for you most young people, I think this is a great analogy that I come to. When they say, I've got this degree, it, does it feel right? Yes. What I can't tell them is that which lane they're in. But as long as they're on the right highway and they're sort of in that arena, that's okay. They may change lanes. The work I do now as a careers advisor is very similar to what I did as a school teacher, which is very similar to me helping people find work. I can see a connection there. I've just changed lanes a few times. When people say, you know, change careers, do you know that? You'll change careers seven times in your life? It's absolute rubbish. There is no research, there is nothing to say where that came from. It's an urban myth. You may change jobs, but I would say that most of you, if you change jobs, you'll stay on the same highway. And underneath it will be the same underlying purpose. And what you're hoping to do is when the job you move to becomes more in line with the purpose that you want to follow. So if we can help young people understand that, then we've got a much better chance of getting them into purposeful work. <laughs> okay, thank you.